So hello, I'm going to, hopefully this is going to record. Let me just check the settings so then I can also upload. Yes, I'll be able to at least upload some of this later on. Um, so I'll wait for anyone who is going to come in a little bit later. Hi, Courtney. So as people come in, if you have questions that you want to put in the chat and we can discuss those questions. Otherwise, I do have a lot of questions that I got submitted through Instagram and on the community post that I had. So I'll start going through those. But as people come in, go ahead and definitely drop them in the comments and then we can talk about specific questions you guys have as well. And just because I think it's boring if I just sit here and do nothing, I'm going to wrap some of the presents that I did get for Stella. Um, I think it's a little bit weird buying for this age because last time she wasn't really old enough to really understand what's going on. So we didn't buy a lot of presents for Christmas and now there's just so much that she could be interested in that it feels really difficult not to go overboard. So I have her mega blocks here that I'm going to start with. And one of the first questions that we had was, what's the plan for Stella's schooling? Whether or not she's going to attend a Montessori school later on and when that might be. Hi Tara, that's actually your question. Um, so yeah, originally the plan was for her to go to a different daycare because I was going to go back to work after my maternity leave was up and that was supposed to be right around six months. And it wasn't until I saw Ashley's video on Reggio Emilia from Hapa Family that I realized that daycare was actually a Reggio Emilia school. Um, but it was just so similar to what Montessori would be and there wasn't any good infant toddler Montessori school around us. And what really sold us is they had like really nice warm floors. So that's the school she was supposed to go to. And then COVID hit and I didn't have a job anymore. So I stay with her. And once she is three, the plan is for her to go to my mom's school, which is a Montessori school. And they go all the way through, they go through lower elementary and upper elementary. So hopefully she'll be going all the way through there. The only caveat to that is between where I normally work and where most of the jobs that I could take and where that school is and where we live, it's like one straight line. So I would have to drive way north to drop her off for daycare, go back down to work and then go all the way back up to pick her up. So it would depend if there is a certain job that I take that would really prohibit us being able to drive all the way to drop her off for school and then come back because the hours my mom would be going there would be different from the hours Stella would be going. But more or less the plan is definitely for her to go to a Montessori school, hopefully my mom's school. Um, if not, there are really good Montessori schools for the primary age as well as lower and upper elementary in our area. Um, and the other question that Tara had was about expanding our family and hopefully, <laughs> we do hope to do so. Um, let me get this over here. But I think not as quickly as is traditional in America. Um, my brother and I have talked about this before. We're, we're 13 years apart, which wasn't also very intentional, but I loved having a sibling when I was that age. Um, I don't think I can physically wait 13 years, but I'm not ready to have another child right about now. I'd love for Stella to be able to at least go and like get her breakfast fully ready, even though she's quite independent in getting things ready now. I'd love for her to be able to at least know that she can feed herself at least somewhat if I'm completely stuck with a newborn. I felt a little bit out of control with a newborn, so I don't want to be in a position where I feel out of control with a newborn and out of control with a toddler. I want to know that Stella's at least her basic needs are being met and she's able to kind of fend for herself. So I'm thinking when she's closer to like four or five would be the ideal time. All right. So if there's not any other questions in there, the next question that we had was the best way to start Montessori at home if you haven't done so since birth. And I think this is a great question because a, a lot of the questions that I see is I have a three-year-old or I have a two-and-a-half-year-old and I haven't started Montessori yet. Is it too late? And what I want to remind everyone is Montessori was started for the three to six year age, the three to six age range first. Dr. Montessori was working with, she was working with kids from three to six originally and that's what the method was started for originally. So it was the three to six year olds and that's what all of the basics were started for. After that, we expanded it to include the zero to three year olds. We expanded it to include lower, upper elementary, middle school, high school. 
but starting at the three age, three year old age is perfectly fine. And I know since my mom does have the school, a lot of parents don't find Montessori until they're three and they're looking for a preschool for their child. And those kids thrive because that's still a really good age to start implementing. So if you're, you have a one year old, you have a two year old, you have even a three and a half year old and you just discovered Montessori, it's absolutely not too late to start. The best way to start, especially in the home environment, regardless of what the child is doing outside, if they're going to a different school or not, is going to be practical life. That's the easiest, cheapest, and fastest way to start implementing it. And it's also going to essentially give you a way to work on all of the other skills that you would work on with all of the materials without having to invest in those materials just yet. So something like flower arranging, that's a favorite activity at our house right now. That's a practical life skill. All you need is some kind of little vase, even like a little shot glass, get some flowers. If your child is old enough to use scissors, get some scissors, give them something that they can pour water with and set this up. Not only are they doing a task that is involved in the community, they're having autonomy. That's the basic principles of Montessori, but they're also worrying on pouring. They're working on that grasp. They're working on posting by putting the flowers in. If you give them different colored flowers, they may work on different color arrangements and different color patterns. If you give them different vases and you can say this will be the blue bouquet and this will be the red bouquet and then you give them blue and red flowers and have to separate them out. So there's different ways that you can easily implement Montessori at home through practical life and still have them work on the same skills that those Montessori materials would be working on. So I definitely always recommend start with practical life. Either something like the flower arranging, cooking is obviously a big one at home, cleaning is always something that kids are absolutely obsessed with. Laundry presents itself with a lot of great opportunities for, again, working a lot of skills. Stella's just finally gotten to the point where she's obsessed with matching all of our socks. So she's not only color matching, she's also pattern matching. And she's started trying to put her hand in to like pull the sock out. So they're starting to understand sequence of events. So the easiest, easiest way is just get your child involved in whatever you're doing around the house. Most likely they're following you around like a little tail anyway, and they're trying to mimic and imitate and do whatever it is that you're doing anyway. So before you buy any of the materials, just set your house up in a way that allows your child to follow you around and do those things with you in a way that is safe for them. If you're not able to let them roam the entire house freely, kind of create a yes space where you're able to do those things together. Um, for something like cooking, if you don't want to invest in a learning tower, I didn't want to um, for a number of reasons, but we just bring everything down to Stella's level. We do have a weaning table. If you don't have a weaning table, you can have any kind of small table that you set up, or if not even that, sometimes we put a blanket down on the floor and just put the bowls down that we're working with, and that's where she washes the vegetables because water's getting everywhere. But that's a very simple way to get her involved in cooking and practical life in Montessori in a way that doesn't involve us having to get any kind of learning tower or a weaning table or anything additional that we don't really want to be spending money on. I hope that answers that question. Um, like I said, if you're joining and you have any specific questions that you want to ask or you are curious about, drop them in the comments and I'll go ahead and answer them instead of the questions that were pre-submitted, but I've got quite a list to get through as well, so we can do it either way. The other one was dealing with the trajectory schema. Ooh, toilet learning. All right, let's do that one because that was a different question. So Stella is currently 18 months. She just turned 18 months. At about 12 months, we had purchased a little potty for her because she started showing signs of just play a little bit of interest, like coming into the bathroom with us, trying to explore what the toilet is, what the toilet paper is, why we're in there, not just being like, destroying everything. She was actually trying to understand what the process is. So I just got one for her and I set it up there and I offered her to sit on it once. And she didn't hate it. So anytime she came into the bathroom, I just offered, hey, would you like to sit with me? And I got her a box of books or a little basket with books. I put some pull-ups in there so we can work on that motion of pulling them up and pulling them down. And I got the books that actually show like the child and there's the Potisaurus book that we have. And we're using that to show her this is the sequence of events. So you're going to sit. Eventually, maybe you'll be able to actually do something on the toilet. Then you get to use the toilet paper because she's been obsessed with toilet paper. And then we get to wash our hands and we get to, you know, just hug and go ahead and play. 
um, it wasn't until about like two or three weeks ago that she really started to understand that sequence and she started getting really interested in doing what the book was showing. So she would sit on the toilet, then she would point to the toilet paper. Mm -hmm. I would get her some, then she would get up and try to actually like flush. She has a little button to flush her little potty with and then try to like go wash her hands and give me a hug the way that it was outlined in the book. And then I tried to give her words for what those things are when we go pee and when we go poo in the potty. And she started saying them and she started saying them in context. So I wouldn't necessarily know that she's, you know, done the number one in her uh, diaper, but she would say like when her dad or I would go towards the bathroom, she would say those words. So I started to understand like, okay, she's grasping. She's starting to understand that these are the actions and these are the words. So I tried going to the potty with her more regularly, especially when she first wakes up from her nap. When she first wakes up in the morning, it's a little bit difficult to get her to actually go to the potty in time. But when she wakes up from her nap, she's often dry. So we immediately rush towards the potty and it often works. And she's gotten incredibly excited about the fact that something is happening. And there's this extra step of like taking what's in the potty and pouring it into our big potty. And then there's this whole commotion about it. I'm not making it a big deal. We're not like giving her candy or clapping or woo, you did it. But it's just exciting. Like, hey, look, you did it. Now let's pour it out. Let's rinse it together. And she's really excited about getting to pour things. So that's been working. We did buy a couple of packs of training underwear for her as well. And she was very excited about that. She knew exactly what to do. She started trying to put them on. So now her dad is home for the next two weeks. I think in the next couple of days, we're going to see if she's interested in wearing those. Because I think naturally as she's wearing that, she's going to be more interested in like, oh, this happened. Maybe now I need to go to the bathroom. Um, I don't necessarily use verbal praise like good job. I just say like, wow, look at that. Like there's something in here. You did this. So it's not a good job, but she's excited that I'm excited because the first time that she did it, I was incredibly excited that it worked, that she actually did something on the potty. Um, and that got her motivated just because, oh, mom had a different reaction this time. So I tried to steer away from the good job, but I think naturally as parents, there are moments when we get so excited you can't control it. And since then, whenever it has happened and she's been able to go on the potty, I do just point out like, look at that, this time it worked. You did have something in your belly and now it's here instead of in your diaper. Isn't that so cool? And that gets her really happy. Now, whenever she stands up, she like looks at it and goes, look, look. And she's like, tries to clap for herself. So she's excited about it. And while she's excited and she's showing all the signs of readiness, I don't want to kind of miss this window of opportunity. So I'm going to try with the little underwear, see if that helps her. I think there's two ways it could go. She might be really excited to be using the underwear because it's got really cool patterns and she's been seeing us use underwear. And then she might be even more excited to use the potty or she might really hate the sensation of being wet and be completely disinterested from that. And in that case, I think we'll go forego the uh, underwear for now and just go back to slowly but surely using the potty. Um, I asked her pediatrician as well because he's not very traditional with some of these things. He's also trying to kind of give kids more autonomy. And that was kind of his idea as well. He said you can try like the two to three days in underwear and see what happens. But he really likes to just give, chance, uh, give kids a chance like two or three times a day just to sit on the potty and see if something happens. And if it does, just acknowledge it like, yeah, you did this. Look, isn't this so much better than being wet in a diaper? And then if nothing happens, then that's okay. And that's the other thing. If nothing happens or if she gets up from the potty, goes to stubs and then soils her diaper, I don't make a big deal out of that at all. I just, you know, we go change and I say, hey, like next time, let's tell mom that we're gonna go to the potty. And if possible, we actually go and like get rid of everything in the bathroom area. That way she can start to make that association that this is where we do it. We don't do it in the changing table anymore. We're gonna do it in the bathroom. So we're working on it and as soon as we get more progress, either way, if it's positive progress or negative progress, I'll definitely be sure to update you guys on that as well. So the other question was about trajectory schema and how to deal with that. And we have had that come up quite a bit with Stella. And I think it comes in like waves for us.
Yes. Yes, Courtney, or Stella is the exact same. She she definitely is not a fan of diapers. She's not liking diaper changes. So I've been trying to point out specifically, like, instead of the diaper, isn't this so much better? And I think she's definitely going to enjoy that experience more so. I hope so, at least. Um, so with the trajectory schema, what has worked really well for us is having a basket of balls in one specific area always available. It's never rotated out. We never put it anywhere else. It's always there and available for Stella. Anytime I see her throwing something that she shouldn't be, I've been walking her back and saying, hey, let's throw this. And I've been giving her not just aimlessly throwing. I don't just let her throw and that's it because she gets really bored of things like that. She doesn't like to just explore. So I would like set up little obstacle courses or I would set up several baskets or I would set it up with a little ramp and I would have her have a reason to throw and then she gets that energy out a lot more constructively, I feel like. Because when I've tried giving her just a basket of balls and say, hey, you can throw these, she would throw like one or two balls and then run over to whatever she was throwing around previously and keep throwing that instead. So once I gave her an actual reason to throw things, so I would give her the baskets or I would give her an obstacle course, or I would give her that ram, she would throw those things for much longer and then she lost the interest and completely forgot about whatever she was throwing before. The other way the trajectory schema comes out is of course through food throwing or throwing utensils. Originally what worked really well is giving her the placemat because I found that she was throwing her, her utensils a lot. Once I gave her the placemat, I showed her time and time again, like this is where we put the fork. You put the fork right here. You put the fork, nope, you put it right here. And eventually, instead of throwing it, she put it on the placemat. And that really helped for quite a while. Most recently, she has started doing this thing with a spoon again. She will take exactly two bites out of whatever we've given her, move it over, and then drop it. He's liking hearing the objects fall on the wood or tile. Have you tried giving him something that he can like bang together instead? So like we have symbols and we have a xylophone and we showed Stella that she can use not just the wooden sticks that come with the xylophone, but pretty much anything else. And she likes banging it on that. And I've also shown her setting up like a tower with her blocks and rolling balls down that way. Um, that way she's still kind of throwing things and she's hearing the reaction of the different materials banging together. But again, it's not her throwing things around the entire house. She's throwing them in a very contained area and she's getting to explore the different ways that things bang together and make different sounds. Um, I think the best thing with the trajectory schema is always to redirect, but yeah. Yeah, so it's going to be instruments or it's going to be giving them what they're trying to do, but just with the items they're allowed to be doing them with. And it depends on what they're throwing too. Like Stella has recently really gotten into throwing around stuffed animals. And while like, yeah, it's not the best thing to be throwing around, we want to be respectful of the stuffed animals. They're not going to hurt her. And if she's throwing about something like a bird, well, a bird flies. So I just try to say things like that when she's throwing the bird around and say, hey, are you trying to make the bird fly? Is that what you're trying to do? If she's throwing a book around is a different question, but trying to just take whatever they're trying to do and recreate it in a more constructive way it's not going to work 100% of the time, but try to leave that activity somewhere that's incredibly visible and incredibly easily accessible. Our basket of balls is like in the middle of our family room so that she doesn't even have to think about it. She just sees it and goes straight to it now whenever she wants to throw something around. There's another question in the comments. All right, so another question that I had was, what's your view on after school activities like music lessons, sports, and specifically, would you wait until they express an interest or sign them, up, uh, uh, sign them up early so they can try it out? And I think this is a really interesting question because I think one option sounds more Montessori and one option is what I feel like is more Montessori. Um, so I'm definitely going to, again, considering everything with COVID gets a bit better, 
I think it's great to give them the option to actually try a number of things out first and then give them the option to decide whether that's something they want to continue pursuing. Because in a way, there is not a way for them to know what they're interested in without having that exposure first. Yes, they can see some of that on like TV, they can see it through books, but it's one thing to see somebody holding a trumpet or even hearing what a trumpet sounds like. And it's another thing to actually hold that trumpet, have to work on the really boring aspects of getting good at something, like when you have to first practice just blowing the scales or when you have to learn how to read sheet music, the very basic things. So I think it's great to give them exposure to what it sounds like at the very end, like going to see an oil, like a concert or an orchestra and seeing what it could sound like when you finally get to a point, point where you're good at it. But it's also really important to give them that chance to try it out, what it actually feels like to do this thing. I think a really good example of that is my brother. <laughs> my brother really loves hockey. He's obsessed with watching hockey. He can tell you about every single team in the NHL who has been traded, who has what a coach. He's obsessed with watching it. He's gone to a lot of uh, live games as well in the area. I used to get free tickets through my old job. He loves it. And for a very long time, he wanted to play hockey as well. But when he first started playing hockey, it was quite a bit different from watching hockey, right? So he had that chance to try it out and he wasn't really sure at first. Um, but it's the kind of thing where like you have to see if they're not sure and they're not liking it because it's just difficult or if they're not interested in it. So I think it lends itself to a lot of communication and trying to understand what is your child's interest because I don't think it's also really great to say, mm -hmm. okay, well, mm -hmm. it was hard so we're going to give up because things in life are hard and kids can do difficult things, they can do hard things. So I think it's great to give them that exposure. I think what I will do with Stella, uh, what my parents did with me at least, is they let me try a variety of different sports that I had at least somewhat of an interest in. So I used to do dancing, I used to do art, I did rhythmic gymnastics, water polo, I did synchronized swimming, I did all sorts of dance. And as my interest or my abilities kind of reached a limit, I did ice skating as well. So there was a point where like financially I would have to invest a lot of money to continue figure skating and I wasn't that great where it made sense financially to continue. With rhythmic gymnastics, apparently I'm really bad at jumping so we didn't continue with that. Water polo was something I wanted to try myself so I tried it. I didn't love it but because I made that commitment to the team, I was in high school at this point, I made that commitment so I stuck it out. So I really needed to go ahead and finish that commitment because, yeah, in the Montessori way, surely we could go ahead and say, oh, well, you don't want to do it, so we're going to follow the child and not finish it. But there's also that sense of responsibility to the rest of the team as well. So I think what we'll do with Stella is once she's closer to two or three, and depending on how COVID is and what all the protocols are in the areas around us, swimming is something I definitely want her to start learning just for her safety. But things like dance, I see she's very interested in dance. I see she's very interested in music. So I would like to give her a chance to explore those classes and complete like one full class and then see what she thinks about that afterwards. If it's something that's really making her distressed and she doesn't want to go and she's crying at this age, I think it's okay to pull them out. But as she gets older, I think there's also that sense of responsibility of, okay, let's finish the class. Let's give it our all. Let's really try to see what is working, what isn't working, why you're not liking it. And then we can make the decision of whether this is for you or not for you. Okay, there were a couple questions. Long car rides. Um, this is a very difficult one for us as well, actually. And yeah, we're trying not to use screens, especially in the car, because I feel like that's a very easy thing for them to get used to expecting. Stella definitely doesn't like long car rides. She actually doesn't like it more when someone is in the back with her. She prefers it when it's just her and I, and I think it's because I start doing everything I can from the driver's seat to keep her calm. Um, she really likes songs. She really likes nursery rhymes. So it's a lot of me singing and making them funny for her. So she really likes her duck and her rhino. And what I'll do is I'll take nursery rhymes and songs that she really enjoys. We'll start singing those. And then when she gets tired of those, I start replacing words with just duck sounds or saying the word rhino over and over and she finds it hilarious. And then we'll st I'll start kind of questioning her and asking her to continue with me. So I'll ask her, okay, 
I'll start like doing the beginning of a nursery rhyme and I'll have her finish it off. So getting her involved as much as I can in that. Other things that she does like is a sticker book. So anything that allows you to really focus on fine motor skills and like peeling things off and putting them back on and peeling them off and putting them back on. We tried the water wow. She wasn't into it as much as she is in like the magic markers, the ones where you need specific paper to use and you'll take the marker and it only works on that paper. It doesn't get the rest of the card dairy. It definitely has something that it's leaving behind, but that's easy to wipe off. It's not actual colors. So those have worked. I know there's concerns about actually giving items in the car seat just in case of a car accident you want it to be the soft things so we'll use those only when her dad is there and that way he's kind of holding them and in case of anything hopefully he's able to kind of move it out of her way so we do a lot of stuffed animals for that reason as well and if i'm at a stoplight i'll kind of chuck one over her and she thinks it's hilarious when there's one kind of flying now it'll probably explain why she thinks it's okay to throw stuffed animals around and that's why i don't set that boundary of throwing the stuffed animals because i'm doing it to her it's not really fair if I throw stuffed animals at her and she can't throw them back. But anything that really gets her either involved with her hands or gets her really involved mentally, like trying to recite some kind of nursery rhymes or sing along with songs to me. Um, when all else fails, I try to have her look at the things that are outside. At 18 months, she's just gotten to the point where she's able to hear me say like, hey, look to this side and I'll kind of tap that side's window. And I'll say, hey, there's a goose there. Do you see the goose? Or if we're driving, now it's getting dark a lot faster. She really likes the moon. So we'll work on finding where the moon is when she first gets in the car seat. And she'll track it with her eyes all the way through the road. But if it's a very long car ride, like several hours, I would really recommend taking multiple stops to get out and let the child run around. Uh, we have, like, if we go on errands, and especially now with a lot of curbside pickups, I still have Stella come out whenever we're doing curbside pickups because if we go store A to store B and then home, we're not going to make it home like that. She named, like whenever we're stopping, she expects to come out. And if we don't, she just gets really restless and I can see her like physically trying to get out of the car seat because it's really hard for them to just sit in that position for a very long time. I mean, we get restless too and we're not confined as much in a car seat. Um, so definitely as much as possible, give them a break to like come out and just move their body around, not holding them, but actually like run around and move their body around. And also make sure they're not too warm in the car seat, even though we're not supposed to have the jackets on in the car. I think sometimes I know I overcompensate by getting the car really warm, but she's a child that naturally is warmer than I. Her natural body temperature is just warmer than me. So I notice if I feel cool, she feels comfortable. And if the car gets too warm, she gets really cranky about that as well. So having... The temperature good, having some snacks, some water, and something to really keep her hands entertained and keep her mind entertained. There are a couple other questions. Alright, so how do we handle the frustration when trying something for the first few times or handling the more difficult, intricate steps? Uh, so are you talking about when the child is doing something that's more difficult and they're getting frustrated with it? Yeah. So I think it sounds like Huda and Stella are, have very similar personalities because yeah, Stella is the exact same way. The most recent example was Clementines. She's really interested in peeling Clementines, but when she first takes it, she can't get the first peel off and she's ready to just throw it across the room. Um, what I've taught her, like what she has learned by hearing me say to her over and over is I'll say, I know you can do it. And I say it only when I actually know that she can do it. So peeling the clementine, for example, I know she can't do that first step, so I don't say that. But once I get the first peel off, the rest of it, I do know she can do because she's done it time and time again. And if she's frustrated in that moment, I tell her, no, I know you can do it. Let's try it together. Uh, so saying things like, let's try it together. I know you can do it kind of gives her verbal encouragement in a time when she feels like everything's out of control. When something is incredibly new, 
So the first time that I showed her the clementine, for example, and I figured she's going to be frustrated that she wants to try eating this and she can't get into it, I tried to kind of set it up in a way where it's just difficult enough, but not incredibly difficult. So again, with the clementine, I made sure to have first peeled a little bit of it because there's no way she was going to start it on her own and it wouldn't be a fair way to start in a way that I know she wasn't going to succeed, if that makes sense. But then when she tried getting the next peel off, because this was very new, she was getting frustrated with that as well. I let her have a little bit of that frustration because sometimes when she's frustrated enough, she'll actually get to it. She'll actually be able to start doing what she needs to do. Other times she gets too frustrated and just wants to walk away. Before she does that, I kind of gently hug her to kind of keep her where she is, but also give her that physical connection. Stella is a very physical child. She loves physical touch. And then I'll say, hey, can I show you? Can I help you? This is difficult. I know it's difficult. Can I show you? Can I help you how to do it? Because she's also not always willing to have help. She's also not always willing to do hand over hand. But sometimes she is. And usually in those moments when she's just frustrated enough that she's about to walk away, but she hasn't yet, is when she's willing to accept the help. And if I offer it, instead of just doing it for her, she's a lot more willing to actually accept it and continue with the process. So I'll start the peel. And then I give it to her and say, okay, can you try? And she'll probably try and it'll keep going. And then she gets to a point where she has to start a new part of the peel. And a lot of times she'll look at me and go, mom, because she wants me to do it now. She learned that, okay, mom did the difficult thing. I can do the easy thing. And that's when I'll give it back to her and say, I think you can do it. Let's try doing it with you now. And a lot of times, again, it'll be the same process of she tried, she couldn't get it. She'll give it back to me. And I'll do a little bit less this time and give it back to her and try to do hand over hand. So I do like a very natural, very slow progression of me doing less and less and constantly saying, I think you can do it. Let's try it together. Or I think you can do it. And the more I say things like that, the more I think she's learned that if I say you can do it, she's believing it more in her own ways. She's starting to believe herself more. So now a lot of times I'll be in the other end of the room and I'll see her get frustrated and I'll yell, Stella, I think you can do it. I've seen you do it. You can do it. And she'll kind of turn around and she'll try again. And a lot of times she does get it. So it's been helpful to sort of train her to trust when I say she knows she can do it. So that even if she's frustrated, she feels like, okay, well, mom said I can. So maybe I really can. I hope that makes sense. I hope that kind of helps with that. I think you have a book recommendation in here too. Okay, on my potty, we'll have to go ahead and get that book as well. Let me see, I had my other list of questions. There was a question of how do you manage your triggers as a parent, like how to stay calm or kind of how do you get through the tough days, which I think kind of go hand in hand and a lot of the gentle parenting and a lot of being respectful towards the child. And that's not easy at all. <laughs> I think that's the hardest part of being a parent and of being a stay at home parent, especially because there's not a chance to be separated. There's not a chance to take that moment to yourself. There's not that chance to kind of decompress really. Um, oh, swim class. Swim class specifically, I want to enroll her either in a swim class or if possible, I would like to start teaching her. I used to kind of help teach swim class a bit. I swim quite well, but I've also noticed it's hard for someone who knows how to swim to teach their own either child or their own brother. Like I tried teaching my brother and he was not having it. And then an outsider taught him better. I know there's specific like survival training classes for kids. So they learn how to, if they fall in the water and they do it fully clothed. So they're wearing like winter jackets. They teach them how to roll to their back. And as they get older, they teach them to roll forward, swim a little bit and then roll to their back again. I don't know if we will go with that style because that's not really a concern we have where we live. We're not near any bodies of water unless we actually go there. Um, and those are not bodies of water we're going to be trying to visit at any point soon. 
by the time we do visit any kind of pool or any kind of ocean, I think Stella would be at the age where it's better for her to know how to actually swim. So I want to enroll her. There's definitely some classes around here that just teach them how to at least basically float and how to start doing some very basic swimming. Um, the earlier you started, I feel like the easier it is. My husband and my dad are both quite bad swimmers. The, my dad can at least kind of float and hold his own. My husband is not a really good swimmer at all. And on our honeymoon, he almost drowned because he just started panicking. We were in the ocean and it's not that deep. Like it's your full body height plus a little bit more. But because he panicked, he just started sinking and drinking all the water in. And that was the moment I knew like, okay, we definitely need, whenever we have a child, to teach them how to at least not panic and try to float. Um, so whatever is available in our area, we're in the suburbs, so we don't always have all the cool like survival kind of swimming classes available to us. But whatever kind of swimming class is available, as soon as I feel like it's safe with the COVID protocols and everything for Stella to attend, definitely want her to start learning how to do at least very basic swimming. Um, keeps hiding the chat. Yes, yeah, the <laughs> Stella seem incredibly similar. Okay, so in terms of staying calm and kind of handling your own triggers um, with the gentle parenting especially and trying not to yell at the child, definitely not being physical with the child. There is kind of two things that I do in the exact moment. And this is on my good days, right? Like I think we all have, we're all working to be a better version of ourselves. We're all working to be better parents. And it, it's impossible to say that I've never had moments where I haven't lost it. Like there's definitely days that are not good. Um, in the moment, I try to look at her, like really, really look at her and realize how small she is, right? A lot of times I'm sitting at her level, so she feels like she's my height because we're eye to eye, but she is so incredibly small. And yelling at someone so small just feels like if you have that moment when you're conscious enough to actually step back and think, oh my goodness, I'm about to yell at someone this tiny, right? And not even, obviously, like there is that motherly instinct and connection of this is my child. But when, when a person gets angry, those things, those things go away. You're not always thinking correctly. But that's why I take a moment and just look at her and size her up. And that kind of starts to disengage that anger. And then I think back to, I think for all of us, we had a very special moment when we found out that we were having kids or when the child was born or if you had anything during your pregnancy where you were scared. So for us, when Stella was still in utero, so when I was still pregnant with her, at some point we were told that she was either going to have Down syndrome, that her brain was not developing at all, that she was going to need open heart yeah. surgery, or she was going to have like intense issues with her heart, or she was going to be completely normal. So we were in a state of shock and fear, and all we prayed for at that point was just having a healthy child. We just wanted to know that this child was going to be healthy and happy. And I like that feeling is never going to go away. And when I'm in a state of anger, again, on a good day when I have that chance to actually step back and try to control myself, I think back to those days where all we wanted was to know that our child is going to be healthy. So even if she threw her spoon on the floor for the 50th time and I'm about to lose it, when I think back to how we felt back then, like it really helps me de-escalate really fast because I look at her, she's so small, but my goodness, her heart is fine. Her brain is fine. She's healthy. She's alive. She's here. It doesn't matter that she threw the spoon for the 50th time on the floor. She's my child and I'm happy that she's here. That's on the good days. Uh, the other thing that I do is at the very end of the day, a lot of times what my husband and I will do is we're going to go through pictures of her. We really miss her when she goes to sleep. I think I'm guessing a lot of you guys might relate to this. She'll be asleep, and I don't know if I've shared this on the channel before. Until about 1 or 2 a.m., she's really good about being in her crib. We still don't have a floor bed, but she's in her crib until 1 or 2 a.m. And then she'll wake up and she starts pointing to our bed. We've tried having her, this is her room, we've tried having her here, and then she just calls out to us and points towards our room. So by 1 or 2, she comes into bed with us. And it works for us. We don't mind it. 
we love the cuddles. A lot of times we're watching TV and we're like, man, I really hope she wakes up early today. Like I would love to have some cuddles earlier in the day today. So we either like focus on that moment or if she's asleep, we'll like go through pictures of her when she was younger and just constantly having that memory of how hard it was and how much we've come. Every single night has really helped. And the other thing that I do is I was a business analyst before this. So I am very analytical of my own emotions and I'll try to think back, okay, today was a day when I really lost it a lot. What was wrong today? And a lot of times it's the night before I didn't get a lot of sleep or it's that time of the month and I'm just very hormonal and I know that or I didn't eat a lot or Stella didn't go outside a lot today so she was having a hard time. And I try to pinpoint what exactly went wrong in the day to make me emotionally unstable or make her really like not in the right state of mind to be as well behaved as she normally might be. And then the next day, I try to be better. If I know I didn't get enough sleep, we'll go to sleep earlier. If I know we were running late to appointments or we had just a lot to do the next day, I try to just chill out and not do anything. So I try to be analytical about what it is that has caused either one of us to really not have a good day and try to change it the next day. And if it's been a day where I've noticed like if I lose it in the morning, the rest of the day is just not going to be easy. So I try to take moments throughout that day to go ahead and have physical connection with her because it helps both of us really regulate our emotions better. If I hug her and she hugs me, both of us kind of calm down more and we just try to put everything else away. I'll stop doing the chores. I'll stop trying to edit videos. I'll put away my phone and we have a lot more one-on-one -on -one time, at least just to get through that day. If both of us are having a hard day, I try to just stop doing whatever we're doing and just focus on being together. Seen a lot of questions come through, so let's go back here. Yes, okay, I'm going to definitely hopefully be able to upload this stream. So if you're missing any of it because your little one's waking up, definitely, hopefully it'll be back up. How to get stuff done with Stella. So yes, <laughs> uh, what helps for us, I think, is our first floor is more or less open concept. So I'm able to be anywhere in the house and still either hear her or see her or see her reflection. And that's where I'll usually do most of the work while dad is at home, uh, not at home, he's at work. So what we have set up is like the Christmas tree I've talked about in my video is I'll put the little chairs in front of it. So if I'm in the other room and she's near the Christmas tree, even accidentally, she can't hurt herself with it. We did have an accident where she was trying to move a sign from there the other day and she accidentally knocked one of the ornaments off, but it just stayed behind the chairs and she wasn't able to access it. I strategically pick what it is that we're going to be doing that day. Actually, the video I'm working on now is our practical life kind of routine, more or less what we do. And I think it might show you better what we're doing throughout the day and how I'm trying to space that out. But I'll allocate one big or two big tasks for the day that we need to get done. So a lot of times it'll be, we need to get laundry done or we need like the house is a mess and we just need to pick up the entire house. And depending on if it's something that she can be involved in, the laundry she gets is very involved in, so I don't have an issue have doing that when she's awake. Picking up the house is harder because obviously as I pick up, she's going to be destroying it right behind me. If it's something like that, I try to do that on the days when I have freshly rotated her shelf or when I've given her some kind of really interesting activity like some kind of sensory play or working with water. But usually in the days when I've given her a freshly new shelf, I make sure she knows what she's doing with that. And then I go into the opposite end of the house because her play area is very safe for her to be in and I can hear her and see her directly if I look around. And I'll go into the other area because if I'm working next to her, she gets distracted by what it is that I'm doing. So as long as I'm out of sight, she can focus on her work and I can start working on the other side of the house. So I'm usually in the living room and I'll start picking up that area. By that point, she's usually had enough of the shelf and she wants to come into that living room. That's where her open-ended toys are. So I'll make sure those are kind of either fresh or I set up something interesting, like I'll put out the blocks and kind of start building them. So she's interested in trying to build. I'll have that and I'll again go to an area of the house where she doesn't really see me, but I can still keep an eye on her. 
and I'll start cleaning that part of the house. For cooking, for example, I break it up. So on, for Stella's lunch, for example, I cook soup for her like every other or every three days. And I'll do that while she's eating breakfast in her reading table because she wants, obviously I want to be monitoring her and know that she's safe, but she also really wants me to be very close to her. So I can't be on the other side of the kitchen or even around the corner. I need to be right there. So that's usually when I'll start cooking her soup because it's hot boiling water. She doesn't help with that anyways. While she's eating her breakfast at her reading table, I'll go ahead and get that done. For something like dinner, when she was younger, like much younger and her play times were much shorter, I used to break it up throughout the day. So if she was having a snack, I would chop up like a couple of vegetables for the salad. And then I saw her playing nicely and she was doing independent play, I would come back in and like defrost the chicken for dinner. So I was doing things in little bursts. That way, when it came down to it of like 5 p.m. and she's in her witching hour, there was a lot of stuff that was already finished and it wasn't quite as difficult to get the rest of the tasks done. I think the hardest things to do with her are definitely like picking up or washing the floors, things that can present danger to her. Uh, washing the floor, she's very interested in doing, but it's a bucket of dirty water with vinegar and the floors are slippery. So things like that are what I will put off, uh, I'll put those off until it's the weekends. And then dad and her will usually go outside because again, if I'm around, Currently at 18 months, she wants to be with me. If I'm around and not giving her my full attention, she's really upset by that. So like right now they're downstairs or they're outside in a way that she doesn't even know that I'm here anymore. And that way she kind of gets her mind off of me. So I'll start like washing the floors upstairs, then I'll go downstairs and they'll come back up. And that way we're never really fully intersecting and she doesn't, she doesn't feel angry that I'm here, but I'm not with her, if that makes sense. But yeah, for the things that need to get done around the house, I need to break them up into small chunks throughout the week. Things that involve me being on the computer or involve me being on my phone, I do those when she's asleep. So I'm not doing most of my chores when she's sleeping. I'm doing most of this kind of work or editing my videos or if I need to pay bills. All of that I try to do when she's asleep. That way, whatever I'm doing, I am always able to either show her that I'm physically moving around I'm modeling things, but I'm also not showing her that I'm on my phone. I also find it a lot easier to keep track of what she's doing if I'm doing those kind of more physical things around the house as opposed to trying to do any kind of work on the computer or work on the phone, if that makes sense. Let me see if there was anything else. Yeah, um, the other thing is a lot of times if she is going crazy and it's a day when she's not really able to hold her own and play independently and play nicely in her playroom for me to be able to keep an eye on her and she's getting into a lot of dangerous situations, we will come up into one of the rooms. Like her room is quite small. It's not fully baby proof because she's not here independently much or at all actually, but I'll still come up here with her. I'll close the door that way she can't get out. We'll close the stair gates. And I'll do whatever needs to be done in her room. So I'll put away her laundry, I'll dust her room, and I'll get her again as involved as possible. She loves dusting, she loves taking a wet wipe and wiping everything around. So I'll give her something to be involved. Being involved makes her a lot happier to be wherever we are that we're stuck doing our chores. And doing something like laundry, I'll usually bring the laundry basket down. And now she's gotten really interested in matching things, so she's trying to match stuff around, she's trying to put the hangers in. So as long as I'm getting her more involved in the tasks, she's usually quite a bit happier to be doing them with me and not quite as disruptive and I can still keep an eye on what she's doing. So I hope that's been helpful. Let's see if there was. Another question. There was a question on what is the hardest part of being a parent and what is the best part of being a parent. Um, I think the hardest part is what we've talked about with gentle parenting and keeping my calm, keeping control because I'm not a very patient person. I'm not a very quiet person. And I am when I'm working with children. I've worked with kids. I've been a teacher. I'm much more calm and gentle with them because they are so small. Um, 
but I'm not very patient with adults and I do have a very short fuse that comes from my dad's side and just being, I think, Eastern European in general. So just being calm and having grace with myself, having grace with her is the hardest thing about being a parent. The best thing is getting to this age right now, I feel like, where she's very affectionate. She's really showing like everything we've put in, all the work we've put in so far is really starting to kind of come back to us. She's really showing an understanding of what we've done. She's really learning things and she's really starting to show a sense of humor. So just seeing kind of that work pay off in raising a child that's been very caring, very loving, very cuddly. She's really excited to try new things. She's really excited to share with us. Whenever she drinks a cup of water, she comes over and tries to give me one, tries to give her dad one. If dad isn't around, she runs around the whole house trying to find him. So just seeing kind of all of that hard work actually pay off in a child that's growing well and growing healthy. And she's really kind and compassionate. That's been I think, the best part and really made everything pay off. There was a question from Courtney. Oh, okay, family's background with Montessori. Uh, mostly from my mom. So my mom has a master's of education. She was a teacher in Belarus. We're from Belarus. And I was not raised Montessori. I was raised very traditional. Well, actually, so I was, I went to a traditional like Belarusian school until second grade. And then we moved to the States and I just went to the American public school system. But looking back to the things that like my parents and my grandparents did, there was a year when I would live with my grandparents when my parents were here. A lot of it was kind of Montessori, I think, just out of necessity uh, because people had to get things done. And the only way to get things done with kids is often just to have them help you out. So if I think back, like my strongest memories with my grandma, for example, is standing on a stool next to her while she was making bread. and working on my own little piece of bread that then came out to be like the ugliest little one in the bunch but I was so incredibly proud of it and I thought it was the most delicious bread in the world. Or I think back to the best thing that ever I did with my mom and that would be like when she was ironing her clothes I got to iron on my own little ironing board next to her like a little pretend one and we were listening to music and dancing around. My dad used to let me pick out which screwdriver he needed when he was building computers so it was always like those kind of practical life, get your child involved with you kind of things that my parents did unknowingly. I mean, my mom did learn about Montessori when she learned about all the kind of educational methods, but it definitely went very much against the former Soviet style of you do as you are told and you don't question it, right? So when we came to the States, my mom had a home daycare, so she was very much a very traditional Russian home daycare. And when she was looking to expand, she found a Montessori school for sale quite a bit away from us. And at first it was very much like Montessori, like the, the, the thing where they do whatever they want, like who is actually learning anything. And then we walked into the school and then we saw class after class where all the kids were working. They were on these mats and they were actually doing things and they were quiet and they were being respectful. And so we got more interested, I mean my mom, but at that point, I was about 14, 15, so I was very interested in it. I had been helping her with her daycare anyways. So they, she started looking more into it. She ended up getting that school, and the people who had that school originally, one of them retired, and one of them stayed behind as the um, one of the teachers, and she also did like the kindergarten-specific focus. And that teacher also lectures at AMS as like a lecturer to train other teachers to be teachers. So she's very passionate about Montessori. She travels around the world to educate people on it and like start Montessori's in other school in other countries. So my mom ended up getting AMS certified to be a director of the Montessori school. And when she was getting certified, even though she has very good possession of the English language, just to be safe, she always had me nearby. Uh, that way, in case there was any nuance that she missed, I was able to kind of help translate her, but I essentially feel like I got trained in Montessori. I obviously didn't finish all the training. I didn't do all the materials with her, but I got a very strong understanding of Montessori through that. And then because I was still in high school and I went to college nearby, I wasn't working as an official assistant, but I was always in the background just as an extra pair of hands. And that teacher who loves teaching everyone taught me a lot about Montessori, about all the different materials there, how to present them to kids. They let me do some of the little presentations guided. So I had 
a wonderful experience just being there as almost like a background fly on the wall and also helping out more as I got more involved and they taught me more about it. So that way I learned a lot about it and then when I knew I was pregnant, I definitely looked more into how to raise a child from birth with the Montessori method. I started rereading some of the books and that's how I found the Montessori at Home community on YouTube and I noticed that it was quite small and then there's while there's that Montessori community that knows what to do and what is the proper way to do it, there's some people who have very confused understandings of what Montessori is and I figured the more people there are online who are kind of explaining what Montessori really is and how to really implement it, the more beneficial it would be overall just for the Montessori philosophy but also for the kids and the parents who want to implement it. Courtney, you had another question. I'm the older one. I am 13 years older than him, almost, yeah, exactly 13 years. So at this point he is 16, I'm 29, and I was 13 when he was born. It was a really good age gap for us. I thought it was a lot of fun. It wasn't intentional, it's just with being immigrants, that's the only time that it worked. I think by American standards, my mom was very young when she had me. By Belarusian standards at the time, she was considered very old when she had me. So it was a good age gap. I always wanted to have that age gap for my kids eventually with maybe some kids in between. We'll see how that works out, but I definitely, like I said, want a little bit of an age gap between Stella and her sibling as well. And let's see. I think there should be more creators promoting Montessori at home. Yes, I think even if people don't Yes and no. So I think if you're promoting this is how we do Montessori at home for our home and this is what works, even if you're not a pro, but as long as you're doing it not in a misguided way. Um, so if you're not saying things like there's no pretend play or we're not using colors because that's Montessori or we're, what else is there? Like we're not going to allow for any imagined play or we don't have any like plastic toys at all because that's not allowed in the Montessori home. I think that has to be a very fine line even if you're not a pro and you're doing Montessori at home of just being conscious of saying like I do with the fantasy books. Yeah we use the fantasy books and we don't use some other kinds of books because that's what works for our home and I think a lot of the people that I do see online are very conscious and very careful to outline this is what Montessori typically does. This is what works for our home. I think in that way it presents itself with a lot of opportunities for people to see all the different ways that you can implement Montessori at home because in the few of us that aren't here trying to explain this is what Montessori definitely is, it creates a very limited view of what Montessori looks like for those couple of people and it might not always be exactly what people want to implement and that's fine, you can definitely implement Montessori in different ways the more people there are that will show what Montessori is and what it looks like in their home, I think the more likely it is that someone will find their version of Montessori that they want to implement at home. I think again, just as long as it's not misguided. I've seen some people almost on purpose do this where they will, they don't like Montessori and they want to kind of promote a different method, which I don't enjoy that at all. I think all methods in the end that aren't traditional are child-centered and they're based in respect so we should respect all the different methods that there are but in trying to do that they'll often say like Montessori doesn't allow for this or Montessori doesn't allow for that and it's usually not the case so just being conscious and being careful of what you're saying is and is not allowed in Montessori because there's not that many strict rules in it really. had another question about screen time before I have to go so there's not anything else in the chat. Waldorf. Um, so I haven't, honestly, I haven't researched enough into Waldorf to give a full like opinion on it. Um, I do think that any other kind of non-traditional approach to child care should have more content on it because in the end, again, Waldorf does still allow for the child to not just sit there and do some kind of child or some kind of adult-led work, not some kind of worksheets. Waldorf is still about letting the child play and explore. It's, 
different from Montessori, but at the core, it's really not. It's still about letting the child do things at their own pace and not having like a person stand in front and just say, this is fact and that's all it is. Are there differences? Yeah, I haven't looked into it enough to know, to give like a really good opinion on Waldorf, but yeah, I think any methodology out there that's not traditional should have an unbiased view of it, I think, really put out there so that, okay, Montessori is not for you. You think Montessori doesn't use enough color, which I think is like the biggest thing that people say of, I prefer Waldorf because it has more color than Montessori. And that again comes from the misunderstanding of Montessori class versus Montessori home. But that's fine. At least let's have more content of what Waldorf really is and respectful content without bashing the other methodologies. That's what I really love about the stuff Ashley puts out. She puts out very unbiased views of this is Waldorf, this is Montessori, and that's all it is. It's not one is better than the other. The more we have content of people really providing factual and informative unbiased views of what these methodologies are, the more inclined people will be to do something that's not just, here's a worksheet of two plus two equals four, and that's all you're going to learn today. I think I'll provide just for overall a better generation, and the more generations we have following those methodologies, the more it will kind of branch out. And we'll have, I think, overall a more creative society growing up as well. got time for I wanted to touch on this question that Priscilla had sent in about how to manage our own screen time uh, while we're limiting Stella's screen time so if you don't follow me on Instagram I recently made a post about how we are still trying to do no screen time Stella's 18 months and we're trying not to give her more screen time than a little tiny bit when I'm working out dad is still on the way and she's gotten used to hearing a couple songs in the background and she wants to see the music videos there is a Zootopia music video and then there is like a Korean version of let it go and she wants to specifically see the music videos of those with like all the animals and that's the little bit of screen time that she'll get that week or that day um, aside from facetiming her Korean family and the question was, how do we manage our own screen time then in order not to model like my screen time versus her screen time? And it's been something we're having to get a lot more conscious of. Estelle is getting older, especially in the past few weeks. She's definitely shown an interest in our phones, like specifically playing with them. She's starting to understand like sitting on the couch, pointing the remote at the TV and asking for something to be turned on trying to get to our computer so we're having to police each other as mom and dad to put our phones away and it's hard for my husband especially because he's at a point where he's able to leave work early enough to come home and really spend a lot of quality time with her uh, and have dinner together and then have play time together but as kind of to offset that he needs to be on his phone checking emails constantly in case there's a question that comes in that he needs to address so there's that balance that we have to have and we've started working on if there is something we need to do on the phone, getting out of the room or if I'm trying to answer a comment that came in or if I wanted to post something on stories or on Instagram, I try to get out of the room so that she's not seeing me constantly on it. I do film her, as you guys know, from the back. The, most, the biggest reason for that is to protect her privacy. I don't want to show her face on social media. But another reason is if she's working and she's looking at her work, I don't want to be in there with my phone trying to shove a screen in her face. I'm usually like backing away, letting her work and just from the background. And if she notices me with my phone, I usually either I will continue interacting with her and like the phone's here and I'm just talking to her this way. So it's just on the side, but she's gotten a lot more conscious of that as well. So I'll just turn it off and put it away. I do have to keep my phone on me because any kind of like questions from doctors or bills or anything like that, I take them on my phone because my husband is always really hard to reach so I have to have my phone on me and it has to be turned on and then you guys know if you have it on you it's really hard not to unconsciously constantly take it out and just check but just seeing her constantly not reach over and try to take my phone from me has made us really aware of just putting it away just keeping it out of sight when she's awake as far as our own like personal recreational screen time we save that for when she's asleep. So for nap time, I'm usually just editing my videos, so I don't really have the chance to enjoy something anyway. 
we save it for like really, really nighttime. So it'll be like once she's asleep, I'll edit videos, my husband catches up on work, and then we have about an hour, we'll sit and we'll actually watch TV. If it's the weekend, my brother will come over because he lives very close and we'll do some video games and then we'll watch TV after that. So we do all of the recreational TV after she's asleep. The only thing I'll sometimes do is if they're playing and I'm cooking, sometimes I'll have a YouTube video on in the background on a little Google Hub. But if she comes in, I can easily turn that around so she's not seeing it because she's she's really become very aware of the fact that there's fun images on there and she's trying to like navigate her head over so she can see it better. And it's gotten me very concerned about like how addicted she's trying almost getting without even having that much exposure to it. Now with the holidays, we're going to be spending a lot more time with my family and there's always like music shows and videos and TV of movies and all these things on and I'm not going to like stop our families from living and having holiday traditions and celebrations just to limit screen time. But I think because most of it will be at my parents' house, she'll be able, there'll be that little disconnect where she's not going to fully associate it with our house and not expect it at home either. Uh, but yeah, the best thing that's worked so far is just to fully, really separate them and just do our own personal screen time separate from hers. Hello, I'm glad you're here too. I have to wrap up in about five minutes. So if anyone's got any other questions, because I've got a doctor appointment to head to. So if there's any other questions, send them in the comments now so we can get to like one or two more. Um, and I'm glad you guys were able to join and enjoy this. If this time works, I'm very happy to kind of regularly do live streams like this. Or if there's other times, especially if you're watching this as like a video and not a live stream, you can drop it in the comments. Let me know what time would have worked. Um, this is a lot of fun to just, I think a lot of this works a lot better as questions and answers and having it as a conversation as opposed to just talking in the comments of the videos as well. I'm definitely going to have to wrap Stella's presence later as well. Ah, uh, being bilingual. Yes. Uh, so far it's been, so far it's okay. We were worried for a while that she was, had like a bit delayed with her speech because what you see online are a lot of different variations of where she should be with her speech. And then with my mom's memory of how fast I was talking, and I was quite a late speaker as well. She was under the impression that we should be having like two word sentences at this point, which we're definitely not at. But we just had the 18 month appointment and her doctor thinks her speech is very well advanced. So at least there is not concerns for a delay, even though there has been all that research that bilingualism doesn't cause speech delay and it doesn't mean that the child will speak slower still that's really a hard notion to shake because she spends most of the time with me and then my family who speaks russian she does definitely say most of her words in russian right now and that's most of the words we're hearing from her 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 dad so my husband speaks korean to her and when he calls to facetime his family he she hears korean from that i'll play music in both uh, that way she has exposure to both. She's picked up a couple of words that are easier to say in Korean than Russian and she'll say those first now. So a big one that she says is kwaja, which means snack, because that's a lot easier if she can point to anything that's like a snack, like a cookie or a cracker, and use that word. Instead of in Russian, you have to choose a very different word that's a lot longer for all of those items. So she's picked up a couple but she does understand both equally well. So I will ask her to point out to all the different body parts in Russian, she'll do that. Dad will ask her to do it in Korean, she'll do that. So she understands us both equally well, but she's choosing to speak in Russian more right now. So we're going to have to see how it works. We did notice so far he's been taking every Friday off for the past couple of weeks and the next two weeks is home. And the days when he's home more and he's speaking more Korean to her, she's trying to say, more Korean words back to him. So it'll be interesting to see by the end of the two weeks if she's trying to say even more Korean words. With English, that's obviously the language that is spoken in the community here. She doesn't hear it too much. We've been going to some stores a little bit when COVID was calming down and now we're kind of stopping going to the stores again. She heard bye a lot. So now she says bye in Russian. If she's angry at something and she wants it gone, she'll go paka 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 paka. And if she's happy and she's just saying bye bye to someone, she'll go bye, kind of like how Stitch used to do it. So she's picked up that one English word. So it'll be interesting to see if she picks up more or not. 
because really all she hears is us either speaking English on the phone, us speaking English at the doctor's office, or the few times that we go to the store and we interact with like the cashier or something. Um, but other than that, so far it's been going well. We're able to at least separate the English, the Russian and the Korean. Dad and I definitely need to work more on using just Korean between the two of us because it's my fault. I still sometimes mix in English when I'm lacking the vocab for the Korean, but I try not to do that as much in front of her now because I don't want her to get confused with like a completely third language coming into the mix as well. Let's see if there was anything else that I missed. Yeah, it's staying consistent, especially as the parent who speaks all three languages, I think is the hardest part. And since I'm the parent that models most of the language to her, it really falls on my shoulders to be incredibly consistent with that. Um, but I think as she's getting older and she's showing that confusion or showing that she's picking up everything, it's made it a lot easier to step back and say, okay, I'm not going to say what I thought I was going to say. I'm just going to wait until she's out of ear sight or out of earshot and just say it in the correct language or say it in a way that's not going to confuse her later on. Let's see if there's any other question that comes in. Oh, the phone got too far. All right. So I'm going to have to end the live stream now so I can actually make it to my appointment on time. Really appreciate all of you guys who were able to tune in. I'll go ahead and try to do whatever YouTube lets me do and put this up on my channel for those of you who missed it or missed parts of it. That way, hopefully, any of the questions that we had going back and forth are helpful. Um, great. I'm glad this time works. I'll go ahead and keep updating you guys whenever I have a chance to do live streams, and I'll update it on the community tab and on Instagram again like last time. And if you have questions, you can drop them ahead of time. That way, we can just get them rolling even if you're not able to attend the live stream. Yeah, thank you so much for attending. I really appreciate you guys. And hopefully there's a video out tomorrow on our practical life activities and what we've been doing so far. So that should be helpful as well. And I'll see you in the next one. Thank you guys.